Coming up on Avant Technology Insights with Ken Presti. My opinion is I think the cloud saved business, right, when when the virus hit. Last March, it was everybody out of the office. Snap decisions were commonplace with the idea that adjustments would be made over the long haul. Whether or not the outside world is safer these days is debatable, but companies are nonetheless looking to tie up any loose ends they might have left behind. We'll take a look at five considerations for doing exactly that in just a moment. Welcome to Avant Technology Insights. I'm your host, Ken Presti, Vice President of Avant Research and Analytics. The link between solving business challenges and cutting-edge technologies has become tighter and more complex than ever before. In this podcast series from Avant Research and Analytics, we help enterprise decision makers sort through the business case, the value, the challenges, and ultimately the bottom line of technology adoption. So listen to us at your desktop, take us in the car, tune in from the commuter train, or download us at the gate. You'll find us on Apple, Spotify, and Google, as well as at www.goavant.net slash podcast. My guest today leads engineering, development, and product road mapping for a major player in the contact center space. With heavy experience in bringing MSP and cloud offerings to the mid-market, he was a recipient of the 40 Under 40 Award and has appeared on or been quoted in CBS News, Fox News, USA Today, CIO Magazine, Business Week, and Inc., among others. He's a founding partner and CTO of Evolve IP. Say hello to Scott Kinka. Scott, welcome to the program. There's a lot of ground to cover today. You've got five points like we talked about a moment ago and that people need to think about in terms of planning their IT and their corporate strategy at the, at the high level there. Now, we've seen a lot of changes in the workplace environment since the onset of COVID-19. We all know that. At first, people literally fled the office and then they started working their way back to the office. And now we're looking at, you know, kind of the most recent wave starting in the fall. So some people are in and some people are out. What has all this meant to the IT environment? And in what ways do you see it continuing to evolve as we go through this somewhat troublesome time? Great question. And, and thanks for the opportunity. I'm happy to be here on the cast. Um, listen, we're, we're in the middle of the world's largest work from home experiment, right? Uh, David Kenny, who's the CEO of Nielsen, says we're trying things out in 24 hours and just rolling them out. You know, can you imagine in the world that we as IT people live in of, you know, test and trial and test and trial and prepping things that we're moving that quickly to adapt to our new reality? And, you know, what's ultimately happening is we we got home, right? We rushed home. Thank God in a lot of ways for the cloud and other technologies, collaboration technologies, the fact that our CRMs were already out in the cloud, that we were largely, largely, you know, and I put air quotes there, right, largely able to work. But I think what's happening now is IT people are faced with the idea that, hey, you know, this go home thing, which, you know, by its nature is somehow not as good as in the office, needs to become a little bit more permanent. You know, if we're, if we're ripping off the duct tape, what does that look like? Um, and that's really where our customers and our, our partners and, you know, IT people that we talk to are asking us, they're saying, hey, you know, we want to rip the duct tape, the duct tape off. We did OK, but we didn't do great. And what does that mean? And that's really what the, uh, you know, the five steps that we're, we're talking about in the, uh, in the podcast are all about. Now, you mentioned that, you know, we're, we look at something for 24 hours and then we either go and no, or go or no go with it. Um, that's obviously changed compared to basically everything we've known about in this industry prior to this. How much of this do you think is enabled by the as a service phenomenon in the cloud? Because I think one of the main reasons why everything took so much longer earlier was because you had to test it out on a lot of different systems that you were then responsible for leveraging, whereas with the cloud, you seem to have a little bit more flexibility and a lot of lot more um, integration points that tend to work better together. Is, is that what you see coming together or is it a little bit different as it rolls into the enterprise? No, you nailed it. I mean, I, my opinion is I think the cloud saved business right when when the virus hit and everybody went home. I mean, if you think about it, you know, the average business, every business has a remote work strategy. 
but if you just take the definition of remote, that means not in the office, right? It's implying substandard to what you do in the office, right? And, and most businesses uh, have a remote work strategy that assumes no more than 20% of the workforce is not in the office, right? So had we all gone home and it was like, hey, everybody dial into the VPN to work, to get back to IT that's location centric, things would have crumbled is the reality of it. Now, I think what businesses are now confronted with, though, is they're like, hey, you know, Office 365 and collaboration or or Slack, or, those tools were already out in the cloud. And maybe I was already, you know, I'm already a Salesforce.com user and that's already out in the cloud. So that was easy when I was home. Um, but what about those legacy things that are still in the office? You know, that's the question that we're getting asked for. How do we go the rest of the way? And by the way, that doesn't imply the rest of the way, meaning we're going to go home forever. But how do we plan a, a user centric IT experience that's consistent regardless of location? You know, one of those locations, by the way, being the office, but but it's not the only location. We've got to go from sort of a remote 20 percent of the people in my company strategy to everybody can work everywhere and it does sort of it, it, it does change the modeling but to answer the first part of your question i believe the cloud had a lot to do with us getting to that roughly 60 to 70 percent operable and again now the businesses are thinking hey what about that last 30 to 40 percent how do we make this permanent so let me set up a scenario here yeah. and you let, let me know if this is what you're hearing from enterprise decision makers as well because we've, we've we talked to a lot of these people so the basic scenario is we ran for the lifeboats like the ship was sinking back in march everything was we got to do this we got to do it now and we'll backfill later to to take out the, any issues that, that are coming along the way. And now we're at that point where we're starting to look at those types of issues. It could be about connectivity. It could be about security. It could be about, you know, the integration of different types of applications. It could be any number of things. It even comes down to the um, issues with, you know, more people focused issues as opposed to technology focused issues. Mm -hmm. What are you telling your customers these days as they grapple with these sort of things? I mean, because there's there's a lot of fear going on. There's bravery, but there's also fear. Yeah, no question. I mean, you know, we've moved away. If you, if you just take for the for the moment coronavirus and we just we put it outside for a minute, right? I mean, it was a condition that forced us to quickly adopt. But if you just think about the migration we've been in towards cloud, right? We've moved away, we moved away from these sort of PC centric workspaces, right? We had a machine, and you know, my identity was was a machine based one, and it was, a, and that was delivered on a device, and that device had applications on it, and those applications were in the office, and that office was connected to the network, and that had a, a well defined perimeter around it, and it had a firewall. So, you know, what happens in that, if you think about it, is that when all of your work is on this domain joined device inside of a location with a with another perimeter to get out to the internet, it kind of cures a lot of ills in your IT strategy, doesn't it, right? Because you can, hey, if the machine is not secured so great, the passwords aren't so strong, you know, those kind of things become really easy. I don't want to say easy. They become less significant when you have a brick wall at the edge, right, where it's on a device that IT delivered. But, you know, we've been moving though out to the cloud and you say, hey, well, you know, there's multiple applications. Hey, it's great that those users, that 60 to 70 percent we were just talking about of work that got done, it got done to um, individual web applications off of a home PC that maybe work didn't control. Right. Maybe who knows, maybe the machine itself that they're working on is a, is a bring your own device, but IT had no strategy on it. So so as great as it was that we were that we're able to work in the cloud, what it did do was it exposed all of this kind of, you know, IT best practice that we got away with in our office and maybe didn't think about on these cloud applications. So these associates who are at home, that's great, but man, they got different passwords on every platform. They're accessing it on iPads that their kids are already on uh, or have an account on. They're, they're dealing with uh, crappy bandwidth in the home, you know, bad lighting on video calls, terrible headsets. You know, the kind of conversations that we're having right now with IT is how to contend with the new reality. And it's almost, it, it almost sounds counterintuitive, but that new reality is almost hyper access 
right? In a lot of ways to, to applications that they used to be able to stick a pretty firm perimeter around and, and maybe be, you know, sloppy is not the right word. It depends on whether you're the IT guy or you're the CEO, right? Mm. Um, Depending on what that reaction is, but let's just say you could be a little bit less tight about your standards on around applications when they were only available inside the building on a PC that you provided that was joined to the domain, you know, and now we're sort of contending with this new reality of, Hey, we got out there, but man, we, we've, you know, maybe it's not quite as easy as we thought for our end users and certainly not as, as easy for us to control. It's sort of a moving from a controlled perimeter to a perimeter less has a lot of value. Um, but it also has a lot of concern. And I think in between those, really is the opportunity for the IT team and, and for, you know, VARs and integrators and, you know, folks who do this for a living to, to start getting ahead of it and planning and turning it into an opportunity. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it comes down to that enterprise decision maker to figure out what they need or what they need to bring to the trusted advisor in order to determine what that next step should be. So yeah, that's, that's an, that's an interesting takeaway, but I'm also running into to two very different points of view. One of them will say, you know, we're working from home a lot right now, but, you know, people are social animals. They're going to want to go back to an office kind of environment. And it's probably not going to be exactly the way it was back in, you know, a million years ago, like in March. Um, but it's, but it's, it's, but it's not going to be like it is now. Um, you know, so what's your, t- and then the other side of the equation is along the lines of offices becoming pretty much a thing of the past. Mm-hmm. Where do you sit on that continuum? You know, listen, I think that, I think that we knew we could go, we realized we could go home and given the technologies we were just talking about, we could work reasonably well. All right. So that's, you know, that's a good thing that gives the business optionality. I think we've also, we've been humbled, right? As a race. I mean, I don't get, don't mean to get, you know, so global about it, but the reality of it is, is this isn't going to be the last thing like this we're going to have to contend with, whether it's a natural disaster in a region or whether it's something global, like the next pandemic. I think, I think the ability to continue business in a flexible environment is the thing that won't go away. Now you're going to have businesses like, you know, you're hearing some businesses are sending everybody home while you have even tech companies who are, who are doubling down on large, large office complexes. I think that'll be a stylistic thing, but here's what won't change. There were certainly people that went home who this worked not so well for, and I'll bet there were a bunch that this worked for, for a lot of people, you know, who, who maybe didn't love going to the office every day. And I think that as, as people have scrambled off to different jobs, the economy got hit, came back, kind of getting hit again. Um, I, I do think what will be a permanent fixture will be one, businesses are required to be flexible, regardless of what that percentage, you know, in and out of the office are. And two, I think that the, the uh, flexibility creates an opportunity for us to consider that, hey, maybe geography isn't so much a requirement in our hiring decisions on a mm-hmm. go forward basis. If at least, if at least, you know, remote isn't a substandard thing, right? At least if we say, hey, working out of the office is a way, not a different way, then I think the business will, you know, we'll start to see, hey, you know, and I can't find that person locally, but, you know, there, there are lots of people who do that in maybe a tech region in San Francisco, as an example, or if you were in manufacturing, there are manufacturing areas where you have folks who are displaced from jobs, but you know, you can get that talent in that area. Maybe geography becomes less important. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been seeing a lot of that lately. I mean, it used to be, oh, we'd like to have somebody who can work at headquarters. Now it's like, you know, I don't care where he lives or where she lives, just so long as they can do the job the way we need it to do. You yeah. know, so there's a very different change in attitude that's coming along, you know, coming through all this. So you've got this list of five considerations. And the first consideration on your list is define user identity and needs. Now that strikes me as a complex one given that you're likely to end up with a lot of different profiles for a lot of different people, a lot of different roles, a lot of different styles. And at the same time, you've got to determine which requests or which approaches to their, the way they want to work are based on wants versus needs. That's a lot to unpack there. It is. Um, what's, what's your take? Yeah, it is. And, and the reason why we started there, so this is sort of step one in the, what we call the work from home blueprint. Right. This is how do you how do you make that 
60 to 70 percent, we got there into something that feels more permanent, that's focused on users operating in locations as opposed to location service, servicing IT and people coming to them. Right. Um, and, and really starting there is interesting. You hit the nail on the head. The reason why you start with the user definition is that as IT folks, we can't we can't say yes to everything. Right. Um, in fact, it gets right back to that statement about moving you know, away from the office perimeter. You know, you could it, once PCs are joined to the domain in an office, you know, I can't tell you how many customers we talk to that have 100 employees and 99 local admins on devices. Right. Because we're in these this we're in these walls. We can we can do that. But when when you send people home or let, at least say when you need when you want to have a user first IT approach, the biggest thing is you have to put people into categories. You know what you can't do. You want to give people optionality, but not, you know, the ability to sort of declare what their work environment looks like. And that's really what that means. Right. I mean, what we learned and you've done a million of these. We've all been all over Zoom calls. Your users are glorious and diverse and interesting and ungroomed and inappropriately dressed for online meetings with kids in the background. And you know, you know all the stuff that's going on. What, right? What we need to do as IT people is 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 figure out a few things. The first one is, you know, what are the categories of worker in the business? Let's not talk about IT for a minute. We're just talking about sort of the people who do functionally similar things, right? Is it support? Is it sales? Is it executive? Is it manufacturing? All right. And then in those users, what are the apps that they need to function? What, what, what's the functionality they have? Do they do they need a phone? Do they need uh, access to the CRM? Is there some legacy application that lives inside of the business? You know, that's there. So who are they and how many profiles do you have? What applications do they need? And then once you understand that, that's really the basis for the IT strategy. That'll dictate you know, the remainder of the topics that are going on here, right? But go ahead. But once you get to that point, okay, yeah. so you, you drop them into the diff different buckets. Now you get mm -hmm. to play numerous rounds of, I want product X instead of product Y. Mm -hmm. And how do you how do you go about trying to figure out what you can accommodate and what you can't on that, on that count? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I think it has most to do with the applications, right? And that's the place where you have to start, which is in each one of these areas, you know, who, what are the applications that they need to do their jobs? Let's forget about the how we're delivering for a moment and just talk right. about, you know, they're a salesperson, so they need access to salesforce.com. They need, you know, they're a salesperson, so they need storage and they're going to do that maybe in one drive or something like that. And then they're going to need collaboration tools to talk to their customers. Okay, boom, we got that, right? If you're in engineering, you're going to need perhaps a, a heftier environment that's got, you know, full access to the network with, from a start menu, uh, you know, with the ability to to do a you know to do a to do a run slash right to be able to get at everything sort of from inside the domain. So it's a very different approach to those. So you start with the applications, and then that will dictate sort of the next piece down, which is about sort of the it really is about the devices and networks. So if you said the, these are the users, here's the categories. These are the applications that are important. And let's face it, one part that I didn't say related to your last question was you are going to, there's going to have to be somebody in those functional groups that are going to have to make a decision for what's important, right? It is going to be, you are going to have to go to functional area leads or to executive management to say, we can't support and everybody gets what they want strategy. What we can support uh, is a functional area by functional area strategy inside the business. So the apps then dictate, you know, a list of questions that honestly, we really never had to contend with at the core of the user experience, which is around devices and networks, right? So you're saying, you know, hey, your device or mine, right? B BYOD was a remote or an executive strategy, right? And I say executive, I laugh with, with our partners and our customers all the time. We're like, who's the first person in the business who brought in a Mac and told IT to join it to the domain? It was the CEO, right? It always is. So, um, What's the device strategy? Yours or ours? You know, if it's if it's yours, how do we maintain and control that? Um, do we have expectations on our home users of how much bandwidth they're supposed to have? Right? Do we do we have expectations on our users, or do we supply them with, you know, a certain camera or a certain headset, or you know, and that what that's going to drive then is what strategies you're going to deploy from an edge. So is it important that you have an identity management 
solution or is it important that you you know have a remote monitoring and management strategy for devices that perhaps you don't own or mobile devices so start with identities and then move down to packing those identities with the way you want them to work or the way you want them to be available to work whether you're in or outside of the office. And by the way, if you're scoring at home, secure devices and networks is the second bullet in Indeed. this list of five. Yeah, that's and that's that's a huge one because that's one of those things where, you know, you can make some recommendations and you can even try to make requirements. But these are these are what people have in their own homes and by and large they're paying for them as opposed to management. So that I can see that getting a little bit dicier in terms of the ability to be too prescriptive. It, it, it is, but what's happening now in IT departments, which then become which then becomes an executive and then in you know an org dev or HR function, is really what does that when you're expecting an associate to work from home, what does that mean? Right? You've you've provided them access and devices in the office previously. So does this now mean all right a stipend for your home device? Does this now mean a stipend for your access? Or like, how does the business, and this is one thing like a lot of IT people are, that I'm speaking to are now contending with the thought that, wow, I mean, this is going to sound crazy when I say this, but, you know, I've had CEOs hit IT people and say, not everybody looks good on camera. What can we do about that? <laughs> right? Are we going to get into delivering podcast lights to everybody in their home? But, you know, that's the reality of it is you, you had a light above their head in the office. So it's one of those things to really think about. You know, Gartner said, um, did a bunch of research at the beginning of, of, uh, of the coronavirus epidemic. You know, I was really researching kind of sending folks home. And they said, you know, many, the, the tools would work at home. This was the cloud conversation we were having earlier. But in a similar vein, many workers, and this is their quote, lack the basic digital dexterity required to assemble and connect the home office. Which, and what that means is that you just create this wildly inconsistent delivery of solutions that you're that you're delivering from the network consistently right but they're unable to deliver for themselves or out to the people whom they're communicating with or what have you from their home so it does it's changing it's changing the conversations quite a bit and you need to rely on IT to be able to take care of those people which means that they need some element of at least get connected get this thing connected and then I'll be able to use an application to get in and, and take care of you from there. Exactly. Um, do you run into issues where, and you probably don't run into it in, in IT so much, but I could see, you know, if you're running a company that's not as technology focused, you may have people who, who really don't know how to do that. And that can add an extra layer of, uh, of problems there. In a case when you got somebody who's working away from headquarters, they're in a different city, for example, and you don't have feet on the street there, um, do you see people you know, contracting with different types of um, trusted advisors or even retail stores that can send somebody out? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, we certainly do see all kinds of different strategies around this. I think what you're largely finding is that IT is working, you know, using some of the underlying technologies in this roadmap. And I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get to that sort of at the end of the five steps. But, you know, what you're finding is IT figuring that they need to skinny the delivery mechanism. And what I mean by that is this, um, you know, the more the critical applications can be delivered via a browser, right? The more the critical applications can be operating system or device independent, right? Mm -hmm. The more you can deliver cloud applications, but unify them behind a single password. You know what that does, and we're and listen. Technology is getting there. Almost everything these days can be delivered via a browser if done right. What mm. that does is put you in a position where you're limiting the need for that digital dexterity. You know, it's one thing when you send somebody home and you go, you know, go to this link, download this VPN client, install it. Uh, and then try to log in with your domain credentials. Oh, it didn't work. Well, it's getting blocked at the port, fil the simple port filtering firewall that's on your cable modem router. You know, what, when you get into that kind, that's what I. That's what we sort of mean by the digital dexterity conversation. Sure. That's where IT. And if you had those, if that was your IT strategy, certainly you'd need to lean, you know, on local partners or or Geek Squad or you name it, right, to right. be able to solve some of those problems. But really, I think it's incumbent on IT to say our footprint needs to be really small 
Right. And it needs to be able to be quickly onboarded and quickly extracted, frankly, um, you know, from an end user's device. So number three on the hit parade is choose a permanent collaboration tool. Um, and this goes back to a point I was making earlier about people having so many different preferences with respect to the types of not just the devices, but the application with which they work. Mm -hmm. um, help me get a, get my hands around that, you know, in terms of the importance of it, in terms of how you get everybody on the same page. Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, the, the, thank God, I think, for the state of what we would consider to be the work stream collaboration market. Um, when, when this occurred and workstream collaboration, you know, we've been talking about UC for a long time and that's generally speaking, UC is sort of your hosted PBX with some meeting services and instant messaging attached to it. Um, workstream collaboration really is that suite of tools where yes, you have meetings and yes, you have video, but information is organized topically as opposed to personally. Right. So this really, in my mind, I would put like Slack in that category or Microsoft Teams, uh, Cisco WebEx Teams. Um, Zoom's capabilities are very heavily on the meeting side, but have some of those capabilities. You know, these tools were already beginning to get heavily adopted when the coronavirus hit. And, and yes, there are plenty of um, preferences on a meeting solution or on a collaboration solution. I think but I do think that there's a couple of things that have occurred, you know, during uh, coronavirus. One, one is that, you know, I, I believe that the next phone system every company will buy will be the one that integrates to the tool they chose to use during quarantine, mm -hmm. right? Because you've gone there, you adopted it inside the business. So many people are not picking up a handset and putting it at their ear anymore. They're just, they're, you know, they've, it's, it's escalated two years worth of adoption in a matter of a couple of months. Right? right in my mind. So if you think about that, I think the winners natively rise to the top based on the tools that IT saw as valuable. So, you know, as an example, Microsoft Teams was one of those tools that reached significant adoption and not as much because customers were already sort of using the work streams that sort of the topically based uh, collaboration inside of teams more so because teams had video in it and most people real, most people were already using a lot of people were already using office 365 for productivity and they're saying hey i can get this and it's not an extra expense everybody log into teams today <laughs> right? right so yeah. um we're so we're really we're honestly doing quite a bit of teams cleanup today you know customers are saying we rushed here to get video but we left everything on yeah, I had you know, a file colleague. sharing and all. You know, go ahead. I'm sorry. Exactly. No, no, no. I have a colleague who says Teams is free like a puppy. You know, because of all those things that you have to do along with it in order. To get <laughs> I so love that. <laughs> I love. Yeah, you know, listen, and it created sprawl. I mean, there's a whole host of governance that goes into the delivery of a collaboration tool. Right. But we delivered these just to get faces and audio attached to each other. You know what I mean? In March. So, and, you know, teams, teams happens to be an area where we put a, we have put an awful lot of focus before quarantine and certainly post. Um, and listen, Microsoft could be the, you know, I think they've, I think they do a fantastic job there, but you know, you could believe that Microsoft is maybe not as, not quite the meetings experience that Zoom is, but our belief that of what's driving the team's meetings experience is that, you know, it's attached to Outlook and, Word and PowerPoint and, you know, Microsoft's going to get the overwhelming majority of that market share, uh, not because they're winning the collaboration war now, but because they won the spreadsheets and word processing war in the early 90s, right, yeah, which led to the point. email yeah. war, which is, you know, so they're going to win a lot of default. Now, we happen to believe that the tool is as capable, if not more capable than the competitive solutions. But, you know, that adoption is what sort of ran there. But listen, we're having just as many conversations with customers for, who are saying, you know, we're on the you know, we're on the Zoom drip, right? And we're not right. getting off at this point. So how do I make this a permanent thing when I go back into the office, not something else we do next to our phone system, you know? Um, so you get the idea there. So really what we're suggesting is, you know, if you went somewhere uh, and you, you know, and you started using it during quarantine uh, and it really, at least, I, you know, I don't want to say saved your business. That's, that's, awfully dramatic, but it was the tool you used to continue to operate. 
you know, your plan needs to be to embrace that and figure out how to bring that permanently into your culture. And that's why we're saying choose a permanent collaboration tool. So get them down to the one that has the highest adoption in the business. Pick it and make it permanent. And that may also mean sort of the statement I made earlier. You know, I, I, I truly believe most businesses next phone system will either be the collaboration tool that they used or be the system that attaches to the collaboration tool that they used during quarantine. So number four on the list of five is enable work from anywhere support agents. Um, this can be interpreted in a couple of different ways, um, depending on, you know, your point of view and basically what it is that you do. When you guys put this into that list, what exactly were you referring to? And help me unpack that. Yeah, it's a really great question. And, you know, one of the industries that, you know, thankfully already had reasonable adoption um, heading into quarantine was, you know, heading into the current, into the pandemic was, were, were sort of uh, contact center as a service technologies, right? The people who were dealing with support, taking orders, doing transactions, booking appointments, setting up calls with doctors, all of that, you know, that, that market has, has been, has been growing steadily for years. Um, so, but, but certainly many customers came to us right at the beginning of all this and said, you know, I have to get agents home. I have to get people, the people who take care of customers home and my current technology won't support that. So that's part of that, which is, you know, get, make sure you are leveraging and it may be the collaboration tool in the step before that, right? Um, make sure you're leveraging a tool that enables the people who are providing support to work from anywhere. Um, but one of the things that was really interesting about March for, for Evolve IP was we had many customers come to us, even those who might have been on competitive contact center as a, as a service solutions. And they were saying, well, I got people answering the phone. I just don't have any access to the other tools they need to do their job. So they can talk to people. They just can't do anything for them. Right. So we did, we did quite a bit of, Hey, can you wrap this one app? I, I don't have enough VPN or enough bandwidth to get everybody from their homes back to the ERP system. That's still in the closet. Right. So, you know, we did quite a bit of for contact centers, just wrapping legacy applications and publishing them to web applications so that those agents also had the ability to work. Right. But this, you know, this category, is, we, we have a tendency and the re, one of the other reasons why we separated them is you have a tendency to think about collaboration as the thing that you do amongst employees. You know, but contact is kind of the thing that you do between your associates or your employees and the outside world. So that's one of the differences, you know, teams and, and, and has been great and Zoom have been great, but we largely used it to talk to each other. Right. Not so much to talk to our customers. So we really need to think about how we talk to customers and think about this. How do you talk to customers when your customer's reality has changed, too? Sure. You know, um, and you know, obviously AI factors into this a great deal, too, especially on the contact center side of the world. Yeah, there's no question. Um, yeah. You know, how do you skinny up? Um, how do you skinny up uh, work experiences? for your customers and and frankly for those who are in supervisory roles inside your business um in an arena where people are no longer sitting in a contact center talking to customers right right i mean right. that was another big one and we had many many customers come to us and say hey you know our my coaching was over the shoulder <laughs> right for my agents and i got them home but what do i do now i can't yeah. possibly just sit there and listen to call recordings all day how can you make that easier and you know ai you know is the technology that figures into that kind of environment Sure. Now, number five, the final bullet point is yep. one here that we we actually covered somewhat accidentally earlier in the show, yep. and that is hire anywhere as location becomes less important. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything more you want to say about that, but it's interesting because with with so many things going on and so much capability, you don't really need to be in that office the way you did, you know, back in the old days. Yeah, I mean, I think you can look at this two ways, right? Certainly, you know, for the business. All of everything that's gone on, both from technologically and culturally, has put businesses in that position to say, hey, you know, I can find and employ better candidates if I'm not maybe looking locally all the time. I think I think what it has done, though, is prevent is 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 uh, presented an opportunity to IT to enable that function. Right. I mean, so often in IT, we're playing defense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the key here is to is to be able to play offense. You know what what? Getting all of this technology tight 
following those four steps up to this point enable you to do here in step five is as the IT person go back to the business and say, hey, you know what, I'm 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 unburdening you, uh, you know, from the from the idea that location matters. Right. So the lesson really learned here is the necessity for IT, you know, to accelerate the development of a technology infrastructure that supports all types of working, you know, not just being in the office or being in the office and providing a remote, you know, quote unquote, remote kind of scenario. Right. I mean, again, you know, remote remote implies that I'm going to be able to to deliver an experience to an end user that's maybe not as good as what's not remote. Right. Mm-hmm. So right. you know, and I so I really think the key the key lesson here for obviously for business owners is if you do all of this right and embrace the situation that came at us, you know, outside of our control, you can turn it into a situation that you can control and add flexibility to your business. I think the lesson for IT is that it's your job to deliver that value to the business, you know, now, right? You need to develop a technology infrastructure that is equally supportive of the multiple ways that your associates, you know, choose to work or are forced to work based on what's going on, you know, regionally or, or, you know, from a, from a, uh, quarantine or pandemic perspective. Fascinating stuff. Five mm-hmm. great points of view on things that people need to consider mm-hmm. as we move into the the new realm, if you will, whether it's the, the new realm permanently or the new realm for a while. Scott Kinka, CTO and founding partner of Evolve IP. Thank you very much for your time today. Some great points of view and some great words of advice for the enterprise decision makers out there. Thank you very much for your time today, my friend. Absolutely. Thanks so much. You've been listening to Avant Technology Insights with Ken Presti, featuring information and opinions on how key technologies can be leveraged to solve business problems. Avant Technology Insights is a service of Avant Communications, a platform for IT decision making. All opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the guest and the host. For more information, please feel free to download our research reports and other resources at www.goavant.com. Net. That's www.goav as in victory, net. For Avant Research and Analytics, I'm Ken Presti.